as in days of old. Rusty, you lazy coon, get on that horse of yours and hike along to the castle. See, the moon is helping us. Yes, sir. I was just finishing another hunk of pork chops that I forgot and put in my pocket. Won't you have a bite? No, I want to eat up something worse than pork tonight. And Jarvis swung into the saddle with the lithe skill acquired from childhood days on the backs of bluegrass thoroughbreds. What was that gun play, Moss Warren? asked Rusty, after he had calculated that they had ridden a respectful distance for inquiries. Rusty had a certain inherited pride. Jarvis laughed, and the dull glow of his cigarette tip was discernible. Oh, Rusty, why worry over history? Leave that sort of thing to these spigotties. That's all they have to think about over here. It was just a question of being pinked or pinking a certain gentleman who was working beyond union hours. Huh, snorted Rusty. I bet the reason I has in my jeans that he was more red than pink when you all got finished with that cannon of yourn, Moss Warren. It runs in the family to shoot straight. Well, Rusty, let's ride straight for a while. We must go up this road to the turn. They passed dark cottages and finally reached the fateful angle of the road. Rusty groaned apprehensively. Uh, say, Moss Warren, I wouldn't mind this all in the meanest moonshine district in Kane Tuck, but I don't like for the ride in this yer foreign district. Why didn't you all pick out some place where they speaks human talk instead of this unchristian lingo? It don't seem religious to me, Moss Warren. Rusty, I'm beginning to think you've got a yellow streak in you with all this talk about objections. You used to have a name for not even being afraid of your weight in wildcats, said Warren. Rusty nodded as he clung tightly to the saddle on the increasingly rough trail. Moss Warren, that was right, but wildcats is pretty heavy, and you all can hit them with a shotgun. The trouble with ghosts is that they don't weigh nothing. Look out, Rusty. Here's a brook. And suddenly, Jarvis's horse stumbled to its feet after sliding down a sharp declivity which had been hidden by the shadows of the big moonlit trees. Rusty was not so fortunate. He was rolling off despite his efforts to receive a ducking. Then did his teeth have reason to clatter as he mounted again to follow his master up the declivity with dripping clothes. Why fo they want a crick like that just below the doors of a castle, Moss Warren? He complained. That's how they got their water supply. I wouldn't be surprised if the old place weren't built right on top of that spring. You know, when this place was built, they didn't have any faucets or taps in these old places except on the heads. They mounted higher, ever higher, swinging on their saddle bows the unlighted antique lanterns. Rusty was unmistakably becoming more and more nervous. The road took a sharp turn to the right now, and they clattered over the wooden bridge of the moat. They faced the great doorway of the old castle now. In the moonlight it was an eerie sight indeed. The castle stood on a broad, rocky shelf. A cold wind swept over the mountain top, rattling the naked branches nearby the dismal walls. What's that? grunted Rusty in terror. Just the wind trying to get through those barred windows up there, you fool. Laws of mercy, I don't blame it for getting out. I wish I wasn't going in. A lone cloud took this occasion to cover the moon, and the shadow darkened the outlines of the sinister structure. The castle, so Warren had judged on his trip up the hill, might have been built in the period of the Spanish Moors. Later, perhaps when the Moors had been driven out of the country, two dismal wings, several towers and turrets, had been added, reminding one of the castles on the Rhine cliffs. 
The face of the structure, which Jarvis scanned quickly, was about two hundred feet long and maybe sixty feet high, with two staunch square towers at either end, thin slits in the wall, and two round windows high up appeared to the mind of the Kentuckian, humorous in the face of the unknown danger, as architectural bungholes. On either side of the great arched door jutted a turret, slit with many smaller openings and possessing castellated tops. As they rumbled over the planking of the open drawbridge, Rusty's chattering teeth were audible to the rider close at his side, and Jarvis muttered angrily, drawing up his horse by the gate which led to the inner courtyard. If you're still too much of a coward to go on, you can ride back, Rusty. This is the first time you've ever failed me in a time of danger. The negro remonstrated nervously. I'm not scared, Moss Warren. I'm just getting straight hair for the first time in my life. I'm going with you. I was just mighty unhappy. A doorway somewhere swung shut with an iron clang. Rusty's nerves were stronger now. He breathed hard, but said nothing. They used to hitch their horses here, I suppose, said Jarvis, as he slid from the saddle. The moonlight gave them a better illumination by this time. He hitched his horse, and Rusty followed his example with trembling fingers. Now light the lamps. My, but those lamps would sell for a fortune in a Fourth Avenue antique shop. Rusty obeyed silently. Then followed the most horrible experience of Rusty's life in what seemed an endless exploration. They trod along weirdly echoing corridors through spacious chambers where ancient tapestries hung from the walls where strange debris lay about amidst the curious carved furniture. Everything was covered by a pall of dust. Squealing and scurrying, the shiny eyes of ghastly noises betrayed the presence of myriad rats. What can they find to live on? wondered Warren. From the high battlements they peered into the valley, and could see a few faint lights in the distant inn. Warren felt sure that one of those lights was in the room of Her Highness. They explored the bedchambers of the lords and ladies of the castle, the little pigeonholes in which the men-at-arms must have slept. Strange, subtle odors met them like an actual presence as they peered into dungeons, stone chambers, and horrid vaults. "'I don't see why a ghost would want to hang around this miserable place, Master Warren.' ventured Rusty, as for the second time they entered the largest room of all, within the central keep. "'We've been here before, Rusty,' replied Warren, sitting down for a moment on an old bench. Rusty looked around with rolling eyes. Suddenly Jarvis jumped up and sniffed. "'Yes, and someone else has been here before. Do you smell that, Rusty?' Moss Warren, I'm so scared that I can't smell nothing. I can't see nothing, hear nothing, except them moans and yowls and all those powerful big rooms we was in. The room's full of smoke and the smell of oil. Jarvis walked about to make certain. Somebody's been carrying a smoky lantern. We're getting warmer with that ghost. A dull thud came to their ears from far within the building. Rusty jumped like a frightened fawn. Good God Almighty, what's that? Jarvis quietly walked across the room to peer into the big stone fireplace. Oh, Moss Warren, I want to go home. Rusty had turned about, and his eyes took in two figures of ancient armor at the top of the broad half-flight of stairs on a balcony dais. He sank upon his knees and bobbed his head to the floor in obeyance. What's the matter? And Jarvis whirled about with revolver drawn. His own nerves were beginning to get too taut, with the tension exaggerated by the superstition and fright of the negro. Look, 
Look, look at them big black boogies standing there, Mars Warren. Uh, see him standing there? Jarvis laughed and put his gun into his side pocket. They're the same black things that scared you before, don't you remember? Oh, I'm so scared, boss, that I can't remember nothing at all. Get up on your pins. They're nothing but old suits of armor, and you're liable to get some moonlight through you, Rusty, if there's another rear-end collision like that. You've been treading on my heels every step I take, and when I stop, you bump into me. But, Ma Swan, pleaded the frightened darky, I'm powerful afraid I might lose you. A fine chance, snorted Jarvis, looking about. Well, Rusty, we've been through this old place pretty thoroughly, and not a sign of a soul, unless they pound or carry a smoky lantern. It's a clue, Rusty, it's a clue. We'll stick right here until we find out. This is the best room in the castle, and the ghost may prefer it. Jarvis crossed to the fireplace again, and striking a match, held it into the opening. Its flicker indicated a good draft. There, Rusty, he said. It's a good chance for a fire. The chimney's clear. Now, break up that lopsided rickety table there and make a fire. You won't feel half so scared with a good blaze behind you. He turned toward the half-flight of stairs with a studious expression as he mentally measured the heights and thickness of the walls and ceiling. I'll scout around a bit, Rusty. Don't you do scouting outside in this room. Rusty crossed to the fireplace with the pieces of easily smashed table legs and began to light the fire. This was probably the banquet hall, Rusty. Yes, uh, as say, Moss One, when we all going to eat? When we get through with this job. He turned thoughtfully toward the big windows on the south side of the room and mused aloud. That's the way through the two long rooms to the postern gate. Hmm. Um, That's where that black thing followed me. Yes, and a black thing followed me, walking on my heels every step I took. I couldn't see where I was stepping. That goes to the armory. I seen eyes in there, and a cold grime of green smell in there. Uh, ain't that where that broad-faced bird flew at me and I slipped down the stairs? Don't you know an owl, Rusty? That's all it was. Jarvis was walking across the room to another door. Rusty was close behind him, following by habit now. I wonder if that door is... He did not finish the sentence. His foot had touched a swiveled rock, so delicately balanced that he had noiselessly fallen half through the large opening in the rock floor when Rusty caught him by the collar and under the arm. Here, I'm holding on now, better, Rusty. Give me your hand. They both tugged, and he was soon safe, peering into the black opening together. That was a close call. Give me that lantern, Rusty. He dropped an old pewter cup left on the side table down the opening. There was a delayed, faint splash. Lord, water and a long drop. No wonder people disappear in this castle. Great Scott, what if her brother fell in there? Rusty, whatever happens, keep clear of this. Give me a burn stick, and I'll mark a cross on it so we can tell. It makes me nervous to see that open mouth of death gaping for us. If you step on this, you'll never see Kentucky again, for sure. Rusty obeyed. Did you hear that groan, Moss Warren? Groan? That's the wind. There it is again. It does sound like a moan. Oh! <laughs> and Rusty's teeth chattered in perfect rhythm with his shaking knees. Oh! <laughs> Shut up. Listen. I guess it's the wind at that, but this place is getting on our nerves all right. Rusty controlled his teeth enough to talk now. Muscle one, dad want no wind. I hope to die if that wasn't a show enough human groan. 
he turned and looked toward the big oil portrait of an ancient Spanish hidalgo over the fireplace. And I wants to tell you something else. Has you ever been in church or somewhere and all of a sudden a feeling comes over you that there's someone's eyes are staring at the back of your head? You just knowed it until you couldn't stand it no longer and just had to turn round and see who it was? Yes, Rusty, I've had that. Why? That's just the way I feel now. Like dem eyes in that picture was a looking right through me. Like he'd like to step right out in the frame, or them two boogie battleship men would like to jump right down on me. And he pointed toward the two suits of armor on the landing above. It's been a good many hundred years since those boys jumped. But listen, there's someone running as sure as you're alive, Rusty. It was unmistakable. The steps came nearer and nearer, and then came a repetition of that dull thud in a distant room. I want to go home, moaned Rusty. Jarvis had drawn his revolver again, and he was standing close to the stairs. Great Scott, Rusty. The man with the smoky lantern has been up these stairs. They're oil dripping, still fresh. You all ain't going up, is you? pleaded Rusty. Not at all. Because this Mr. Ghost, or some of his spooky friends, are probably waiting at the top of the stairs with a long gun, and I'm no book hero. Suppose it might be that there Mrs. Princess's brother? Well, he might blow my head off because he doesn't know what I came here for. And if it's someone else, they'd blow it off because they do know why I'm here. There's somebody trying to scare us, Rusty. They're probably watching every move we make. That's where that pounding comes from. Why don't they shoot? They're trying to scare us, as they did the poor boobs down in the village. Rusty crossed toward the fireplace. He picked up an old mallet and chisel from the mantel, which was brighter now from the fire. He cried out in surprise. Look here, Master Warren, look here. He handed the tools over to the astonished Jarvis. I found them on that mantelpiece. Jarvis ran to the mantelpiece and clambered up on a chair, holding the lantern close to the wall. Good boy, Rusty. These are the ghost tools, all right. Someone was working in this room, but we've beaten him to it. Mortar on the floor, mortar on the mantel. Look here at these stones. That's where he was working, Rusty, and we've beaten him to it. He stopped, and both of them turned simultaneously to look at the big picture of the historical Spaniard. Rusty had drawn his own revolver, with Jarvis doing the same by a curious instinct. Did you feel that too, Master Warren? asked the frightened negro. Jarvis said nothing. He went to the pitcher, and lighting a match, passed it all around the frame, examining it without the discovery of a suspicious thing. He turned away, then faced it once more, as he backed toward the low balustrade of the steps over which stood one of the suits of armor. By George, that's weird. You could feel that just as plain. Rusty was still looking with fascination at the picture. It sure is, Master Warren, it sure is. He turned slowly facing Warren Jarvis. He had just time for one piercing howl, a veritable high-pitched scream. My God, look out! Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share, and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.